expect, first of all, a general understanding, greater awareness of our key political goals. Universal access by 2030, reducing energy uh, intensity by 40% by 2030, promoting 30% renewables in the global energy mix by, by 2030. If you put all of Africa together, you're talking something like one out of three people having access to electricity and modern fuels for cooking. But once you take the North and South Africa out, then you are down to something around 20%, and therefore only one out of five Africans have, have access to electricity and modern fuels for cooking. And then if you go further, between urban areas and rural areas, you can find some rural areas where some more than 90% of the people don't have electricity and sometimes even more. If you have energy and you have other conducive developmental activities occurring at the same time, then you can enable people to better their lives, to have better employment, to have better income, to have better education, and to bring themselves out of poverty. So, I mean, clearly energy is a means to, to delivering those other developmental goals. World Energy Forum of the UN Organization UNIDO in Vienna's Hofburg. Investors, technology experts, politicians and non-profit organizations meet here to herald a turning point in energy. Renewable energy sources are to replace environmentally destructive fossil fuels. With joint forces, a third of the world's energy needs should be covered by renewable energy sources within the next 20 years. Economy and environmental protection shall move forward in accord. Green technologies shall push the economy and help the poor at the same time. The situation in developing countries is sobering. 1.5 billion people live without electricity and another billion without stable access to electricity. At the Energy Forum in Vienna, another step towards approaching the Millennium Development Goal is intended. The liberation of two and a half billion people from energy poverty. Universal energy access isn't about just lighting a dark room or cooking on a better stove. It is about the freedom that energy and especially renewable energy gives us. We don't have to be slaves to faulty grids. We don't have to watch our citizens get sick and die from pollution. We don't have to worry about a corrupt dictator waking up one morning on the wrong side of the bed and deciding to shut off the power of our country. A typical urban residential area in Africa. Just like here in the capital of Uganda, Kampala, most of the urban population of Central Africa lives without work and hope. The people living in these simple houses can escape the downward spiral of poverty only with the help of the international community. For them, the availability of electricity is one step towards a world with a future. At the Energy Forum in Vienna, experts debate how universal access to energy can be achieved. And in the rural areas, the remote rural areas, the situation is very bad. They, are, they don't have electricity, so they're cooking at best with... They don't have electricity, they don't have gaseous fuels, so they're cooking with firewood and charcoal sometimes, sometimes even lower, you know, agricultural residues, very smoky, lots of problems on the health side, because it's usually women you know, with children on their backs, you know, who are cooking and inhaling all these fumes. So, you know, that's causing a lot of deaths, you know, in, in, in rural areas, especially, okay? And then also on the electricity side, you know, because they don't have electricity, um, they are almost left to the, you know, to the mercy of nature. And, you know, pupils who go to school cannot study at night because there's no lighting in the homes. Um, they don't have any ICT exposure, many of them in those areas. So those are serious limitations that um, people in these deprived areas of Africa face. And the majority of Africans are in that situation. For many poor households, even when they have electricity, they're not using electricity for cooking. Uh, for cooking, they need other fuels. And currently, there are three billion people in the world that are using solid fuels for cooking. That means biomass, wood, charcoal, um, fire, uh, you know, all kinds of biomass, and coal as well for cooking. And this has 
enormous negative impacts on their lives because women and children have to go out to go collect the wood. They spend a lot of time in that. They have health impacts because of the pollution from cooking with these on very simple devices. And therefore, this has to be a very important part of the energy issue when you're talking about energy access. It cannot be only electricity. It has to be cooking fuels as well. And we're doing a lot of analysis to really look at what are the current patterns of consumption in households in poor countries? What are the fuels that they use for cooking? What are the kind of policies that will be needed to enable them to, to transition to cleaner cooking fuels or cleaner cooking stoves? And basically the kind of work that we've done shows that you need some kind of price mechanisms to make the prices of the fuels cheaper, of the, the cleaner fuels cheaper. So whether that's subsidies or other price mechanisms, there can be a combination of different policy mechanisms that can enable that. Then you also need ways and means to provide credit to households that they can buy improved stoves, so cleaner stoves, whether they're switching to a new fuel like LPG or they're switching to an improved biomass stove, they still need money to be able to buy the new stove. So you need to have some credit mechanisms that they can borrow money at a cheap rate of interest that will enable them to make that upfront investment in the stove costs. Electricity for all, but who is supposed to pay? The financial architecture is very complex. So countries that are poor, that are least developed, don't have the capacities to be able to reach to the financial uh, markets and to financial funds that are out there to be able to finance it for the future. And I think that they, together with the UN system, with UNIDO, with the Global Environmental Facility, with the scaling up capacity of the World Bank, and uh, with UNDP, a capacities to work with the government, we can make it happen. What we try to do at the World Bank is to support countries in developing the policies uh, and institutions that are necessary to uh, promote investments. Um, so what we do is we help uh, with advice on legislation, on regulation, on public-private partnership opportunities. So we provide not only loans in terms of financing, but we also provide policy advice. Uh, and in all the countries that we've worked in so far in, uh, in promoting energy access, uh, we do a combination of this kind of technical assistance to get the enabling environment right so that there is uh, an incentive to produce more energy, to consume energy, uh, that uh, costs are recovered uh, and that there is uh, national consensus on how to go about doing it. Uh, who are the, what are the priorities? Uh, who should provide what services? That is the nature of the dialogue that the World Bank has with its, with its uh, partners uh, in countries. And we also work very closely with bi the bilateral development agencies to bring a uh, collaborative approach to uh, energy uh, sector development in the countries. Ein, ein lebendiger Privatsektor, der ja die uh, Jobs schafft. A vivid private sector, which actually creates jobs, cannot exist without energy. Though people are supposed to pay for their energy consumption themselves, the basic infrastructure for energy supply and the upfront investments have to be provided by public institutions through national or international cooperation. I think what uh, the World Bank focuses on is our primary mission is poverty alleviation. And so all our projects uh, are, are focused really on how uh, energy access can improve uh, the various, for example, Millennium Development Goals. It's, so it's not just about infrastructure, uh, it's not just about investment by itself, but it's really about how do we uh, improve uh, on various development goals of the countries, uh, reducing poverty, uh, improving the business environment, improving, uh, creating new jobs, uh, and local manufacturing, local businesses. Uh, so all that is really part of the, the policy development that we work with in the country, not just individual projects. 
even when it comes to providing other services like healthcare, education and so on, you need energy for that because clearly for healthcare you need refrigeration, you need transport uh, to, uh, and so on and all of that requires energy. So I mean I think energy is a good entry point to discussing all these other developmental um, issues because you need energy in order to provide all these services and therefore energy um, is fundamental. Access to energy means access to work. With energy, stores can be lighted and the craft can be practiced. With power, you can create a cooler environment. Power means refrigeration and light at night. Most people use candles and kerosene burners to produce light. This means that for people in Africa, the sunset actually means the end of the day. We are working on solutions for that, in particular with solar lamps or with small solar systems. In Africa, people own mobile phones even in rural areas, but they are lacking power to recharge the phones. With the help of these small solar systems, we can enable them to stay connected with people from the cities. Let's have a look at solar power systems, for example. Twenty years ago, prices for such solar systems were pretty high and hardly competitive. Back then, the price of diesel was low. Now the situation has changed. Due to the increase in oil prices, diesel is getting more and more expensive, while solar companies have been improving. Solar modules are down to one-third of the costs from 10 years ago. Battery technology is getting better and better, and we see a lot of progress in this field, as well as in the field of lighting. Small LED lamps have replaced the classical bulb. The energy system can be constructed smaller, with smaller solar modules and smaller batteries, and still produce the same amount of electricity. <laughs> There's a lot of work going on right now on looking at different kind of improved stove options. Uh, and these stoves, some of them are sort of only slight improvements on existing technologies, some are very advanced improvements on existing technologies. And I think it's, it's very good that you know, there's a lot of work going on in this area. But at the same time, I think there needs to be much more standards and labels for these technologies, because otherwise what happens is, you know, there is some improvement, but it's not enough. And, and therefore, uh, there needs to be a sort of a more of a global effort at doing standards and labels for improved cook stoves. But yes, they have enormous potential, because it means if you're increasing efficiencies, if you're reducing pollutant emissions, then that has huge benefits for women particularly because that means they have to collect less fuel for instance uh, they can burn it more efficiently they don't have to inhale all the smoke and all the other pollutants that are being emitted while burning the fuel and you know it frees up their time to do other productive or uh, educational activities as well. I think we've seen successes uh, particularly in Africa uh, many, many countries now have got strong policies, they're seeing growth rates that are much higher than historical rates, uh, and especially in the energy sector we're seeing uh, many countries such as Kenya and Rwanda and Mozambique, Ethiopia, Senegal, uh, now really having very ambitious programs, Ghana for example as well, uh, to really spread access. Uh, to improve the quality of the sector so that there is more investment in generation. They're looking at regional projects, uh, so we're seeing more and more regional cooperation. Uh, so I think there is, and now there are, you know, the, the rate of growth in energy access is still very painfully slow. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, we don't have uh, the kind of progress in energy access the way we have, say, mobile phones. 
Uh, so, but I think um, more and more countries are developing strategic approaches uh, and are able to mobilize the resources and really set for themselves uh, policy targets. The island chain Cape Verde in West Africa. The Ten Islands succeeded in switching from fossil to renewable energy. It is one out of many projects where the private sector and the provincial government cooperate to provide clean energy supplies for the population. It was launched by the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, ECRI. What is being an island, small island sometimes, each island has its own isolated supply. So within this isolated supply, they now bring in renewables to replace the diesel generation, which was predominant. So it's more or less an isolated supply into the various islands. The solar projects were financed by concessionary loans from development partners. But the wind project is being financed through project financing with a private developer. But the funds are coming from the development banks and guaranteed by the government. So they are, so it's two different type of financing, but both schemes are working very well so far, so good. Why we choose renewables? Renewables, they are greener, they don't pollute the atmosphere, and today they are also competitive compared to the conventional technologies. If you look at diesel generation today, you have diesel generation in the range of 24, 25 cents per kilowatt hour in the region, and that's what most of the countries rely on. There are renewable energy technologies that go as low as 15, 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And they also come in smaller units. It's easier to develop, easier to mobilize the financing, and faster to implement. So if we want the solutions to our problems quickly, then we go for such options, which, above all, also pro protect the environment. The non-profit organization ACRI supports many local projects in developing countries to switch to green technologies. In Africa, there are so many oil sources, uh, but unfortunately, oil in Africa, most African countries, is seen as a, a tradable commodity that you need to sell for cash. And that has been the emphasis you see in most of, even a country like Nigeria with huge, enormous oil and gas potential, they export a lot of oil and gas and they don't even have enough to generate electricity at home it's because it seems more as a tradable commodity rather than an energy product. So, but your sun, your wind, and your water, it's not easy to be carried away. So if you focus on that, you can still make a living. Moreover, there are most countries that do not even have it, the oil at all. So practically, these are the solutions left to them. When the oil price went up in 2008 to almost $100 a barrel and above, you'll be, you'll be surprised to know that most of the countries had to shut down the power plant because they couldn't afford the oil bill anymore. And they couldn't continue increasing the price of electricity because it was no longer affordable to the population. But if you have renewable energy sources, at least you can be sure that the tariff will not just jump up overnight, that people cannot afford it. And sure, there will be instances where there will be no sunlight or there will be no wind, but it's very, very limited. And you can then um, uh, what supplement that portion of time without window solar with some conventional generation, but it goes a long way to save a lot of uh, in, uh, in a, a lot of uh, resources in uh, in terms of fuel. OFIC is uh, OPIC Fund for International Development. It has been established since 35 years by the OPIC member countries. Uh, in solidarity with the other developing countries. Our first window was providing loans to the governments. 
but we innovated in financial solutions through giving uh, loans to the private sector or giving trade finance to enhance the to, to make them able to import fuel or uh, equipment required uh, for their uh, development and we also provide grants as well for the poor that cannot pay back any loan or any form of financial assistance. For those it's a pure gift, it's a grant which can support them for their, for their initial stage to pick up. We help people to help themselves. Actually, Ufid has committed itself since its inception 35 years uh, ago to foster all uh, sectors, and especially the energy sector. And uh, in the recent years, um, uh, we have already committed a lot for the energy sector. And alone in 2010, um, uh, uh, the lion's share of Ofit's commitments went to the energy sector, almost 24% uh, of total commitment in 2010. Uh, actually, uh, uh, it helped to fund 18 uh, projects, developing projects uh, in the area of uh, energy um, uh, in 11 countries, mostly in Africa, where we believe energy poverty is widespread and severe. Energy poverty involves poverty in generation of electricity, involves uh, poverty in uh, being able to transmit this electricity to the poor people, and also it involves providing lighting and heating for all those poor people. We help in all these areas. We help in uh, building power plants, we help in uh, financing uh, transmission lines to the uh, countryside and to the rural areas, and we also give grants, uh, the latest of which we were uh, providing grants to provide solar lanterns to the very poor people in Africa, and we are trying to introduce these modern energy services to them so that they both don't burn wood and pollute the environment. So we are achieving a double purpose of saving the environment and providing energy to the poor people. Many NGOs support developing countries in implementing renewable energy. They provide impetus for development and help with difficult questions of detail. Energy turnaround needs competence. Wir sind eine kleine nichtstaatliche Organisation oder NGO, so wie es heißt auf Englisch. We are a small non-governmental organization. We support the development of renewable energy and energy efficiency in developing countries. We raise money for projects, we organize events for stakeholders, and we try to establish a solid ground for renewable energy in developing countries. Most important is to create conditions within the country that allow the market for renewable energy to be developed. One of our current projects is to redesign the energy policy of Namibia in a way that renewable energy and energy efficiency can be implemented. So the most important task is to create a solid ground for private companies. Renewable energy is still considered luxury for the West, too expensive for developing countries. This view needs to be changed. The implementation of new technologies in a way that power gets to where it is needed presents a major challenge for developing countries. All technologies are available. 
Nowadays, the golden mean is the small grid. The aim is to have a small network with a biomass power plant, maybe wind power and solar panels, just enough to supply a small village. Um, Biomassekraftwerk gibt, es gibt uh, gegebenenfalls Wind, es gibt Solar und die uh, haben, versorgen aber nur ein winzig kleines Dorf. Um, die politischen Möglichkeiten dadurch sind There are political opportunities that may embrace the start of establishing the energy supply in the villages and developing a bigger network from there. We are constructing in a way that every one of us becomes a small energy producer and not a customer. We don't want the large power companies to profit. I believe that this is the key matter and political question when it comes to debating how access for poor people can be provided. Yeah, there are many people who would like us to do that. But we have to face it, that there are oil exporting countries in Africa who have liquid fuels and they have gas. Okay. Now when you have these, it only makes sense that you use them to meet your needs. So in countries like Nigeria, Angola, even now my own country now, Ghana, you know, we just hit oil. And there are others, you know, Cameroon, Chad, we're going to have to use these fossil fuels to meet a big part of our needs and hopefully also export some to our neighbors. So let's, I think let's be clear about that. That's going to play a role as we go, a big role as we go into the future. But increasingly the renewables are going to come in. And they're going to come in for several reasons. I mean, one is the fact that, you know, Africa has the highest levels of solar radiation, probably anywhere in the world. I mean, maybe Saudi Arabia might compete with us. But apart from that, you know, it's really Africa and the desert where we have the highest levels. Africa has the highest land mass. So when it comes to bioenergy, I mean, Africa really will have the largest store of bioenergy. We're not very strong on wind. I mean, if you go down south, South Africa, and a bit of the north, and then a bit in the Gulf of Guinea, you know, around my own country, along the shoreline, you have modest amounts of wind, but they're nowhere compared to the levels of the wind regimes that you have in Denmark and, and places like that, okay? So particularly on solar, bioenergy, and also on hydro, Africa still has large hydro resources, particularly the larger hydro, and in some countries, a lot of the smaller hydro schemes. So yes, they'll play a role. Hydro has always played a role, no question about that. I mean, my own country, the first major developments we did, you know, where the Akosombo Volta River project that has served us very well for the last 50 years and more. Okay, so hydro is going to play a role. There are big sites in the Central Africa that can solve, you know, a good part of Africa's problems. There's the Inga project, for instance, that can do 40 gigawatts or something like that. Okay, so, you know, hydro is going to play a major role. And then increasingly, the new renewables, solar, and to some extent also the bioenergy forms, modern bioenergy forms are going to come in. But they're going to come in gradually and they're going to ramp up over time. We need the decentralization of energy and therefore rules that entitle private parties to sell excess energy to the energy grid. In the future, every one of us will become a power company. In addition to that, we still need big projects in which big energy companies can invest. I am thinking of big projects like offshore wind, big wind farms, desert tech, huge solar panels in the desert. These energy sources will still produce energy centralized for the net. Still, the energy industry as a whole will change completely within the next 20 years. Energie produzieren und ins Netz. Was, aber die gesamte Energiewirtschaft wird sich in den nächsten 20 Jahren vollständig ändern. For poor countries with a high level of technical development like India, nuclear energy is still of great importance and will be expanded. Nuclear is something that a lot of the African scientists and, and, and not just even the scientists, but some African renaissance type people would like to see in Africa, okay. Now, but then nuclear is a divisive issue because you find very much on the opposite side people who say we're not quite ready yet. One, because our grids are still small. And, and for nuclear power, you know, you need large grids. I mean, the plants come in large sizes, sometimes a thousand megawatts, you know, 1,500 megawatts or more, and you need large grids. Many African countries have 100 megawatts, the whole country. 
you know, 100, 200 megawatts. So nuclear power is really not a practical option in those countries for, and it's going to be so for a long time to come until the countries themselves grow their power systems, okay? But for those countries that can, South Africa, North Africa, and aspiring, emerging, if you could call us, countries like Nigeria, Ghana, and others, nuclear is something that sections of the population at least would like to see coming in in about maybe 15, 20, 10, 15, 20 years time. But it's quite clear for many of our smaller countries, nuclear is not an option today. And things are changing very fast with nuclear. I mean, Germany has decided not to do any more nuclear from what, from what we understand. So things could be very different by the time we are ready to, to integrate nuclear possibly into our grids. And I think we'll have to just take it a step at a time. But as we speak at this point in time, nuclear is not a practical option, you know, for many of our, for the majority of our countries whose systems are just too small to take a nuclear power plant. Wind power on land is already competitive with charcoal and other energy sources. In regions with high electricity prices, solar panels are competitive too. For energy sources like coal, the price is stagnant, while nuclear power gets more expensive due to necessary safety standards. At the same time, solar, hydro and wind energy prices are decreasing. In a long-term perspective, sustainable energy is demanded. Yet it is just a matter of time, and the question arises whether we are able to clarify the climate issue with the currently used energy sources. It's not an ultimate question. Und damit ist die Frage nur, können wir mit den Energieträgern, die wir heutzutage einsetzen, die Klimafrage klären oder nicht? Das ist sozusagen nur eine Frage der, der Geschwindigkeit und nicht sozusagen eine Frage, welche Technologie wird gewinnen. Austrian Federal President Heinz Fischer visiting the Energy Forum in Vienna. The occasion is the meeting of the Circolo Montevideo. This exclusive club discusses strategies for sustainable development in Latin America. The situation in the countries of Latin America differs a lot. On average, one quarter to one third have no access to basic services of the state. They have neither electricity nor drinking water, no canalization, and no garbage collection. These basic infrastructure facilities are lacking for many people in Latin America. Policy must focus on providing money for that poorest third of the population. A big part of this quarter to one-third of the population is young people. Their access to education is inadequate too. Without education, they have no chance to survive on the labor market. A well-functioning labor market for the energy sector, on the other hand, is of crucial importance. To establish a comprehensive energy economy, we need professionals for developing and producing new technologies. Latin America has huge energy reserves. We have a lot of wind and large amounts of oil and gas. Also, a new source for the extraction of gas was found, namely clay and sand. Ten years ago, this technology was still unknown. The scientists have done the groundwork. Esta es una nueva dimensión que ha aportado la nueva tecnología. Hace 8 o 10 años esto no se conocía. They have researched for a long time how to obtain gas, and now the technology is implemented. It works like this. In the bottom layer of soil, clay and sand layers contain gas. 
From these layers, the gas is extracted. This new technology is of great importance. Access to energy can have an enormous impact on raising living standards, assuming that government regulations are predictable for investment and that the distribution and access is guaranteed for all. El futuro es muy promisorio, el futuro es muy optimista. The future is promising. There are still large oil reserves. In Brazil, new sources of oil were recently tapped and new gas wells in Argentina. Also, in relation to water power, there is still great unutilized potential. This makes us optimistic. We should take advantage of the favorable economic situation. The first step has to be to establish a democratic regime and increase the income per capita in a way that it is evenly distributed. This means there must be less public corruption. As long as corruption prevails, equitable distribution won't be possible. Then, as a second step, the quality of governmental institutions has to be increased, especially in terms of predictability and reliability. This is of great importance for investments. Anarchy can swallow a lot of money, and energy is expensive too. We are looking for long-term investments, so trust has to be created. As Felipe González said at the meeting here, it is essential that the states act in a predictable way. Democracy is the base for a flourishing economy and for energy development. Yet too much money still flows into major projects and too little into local energy projects for the poor. Where the money comes from or goes to seems to be the big question. We are talking about an amount of approximately 30 to 35 billions, which need to be raised for achieving global access to energy. Um, wenn man sich anguckt, uh, wie viel die 13 Milliarden, die die Weltbank alleine zurzeit hat, from the 13 billions that the World Bank has at its disposal for fighting poverty, only two thirds of this are invested in large charcoal or other large energy projects, mainly coal, gas, and oil. Only two projects out of 26 enabled poor people to get access to power. The other 24 were meant for energy. The other 24 were meant for energy, industry and cities. You know, whether it's in Africa or, for example, in, in, in Asia, Vietnam has made incredible. They're almost at 100 percent energy access from very, very low levels uh, in the 1970s. So we are seeing progress, um, but uh, I think there are still gaps, uh, particularly, I think, gaps in terms of generation. The generation capacity, for example, in Africa is very, very uh, small right now, even though the potential is great. They have a lot of hydropower potential, uh, but they don't have very much uh, in terms of power plants there. Uh, also, I think we have to do more in not just electricity, but also for cooking. Uh, still, uh, almost three billion people on the planet are using uh, what would not be considered clean cooking uh, facilities. So we have to really look at the whole variety of, of energy services, electricity, cooking, heating, lighting, off-grid and on-grid. Uh, and so those are the challenges. We, sometimes we see our successes really only in one dimension, but there are many different parts to the energy sector that we have to still work on.
There are a lot of regional differences as well as commonalities. All countries, including Austria, have in common that energy efficiency has not yet been developed to its full potential. This means that with the same amount of energy, a lot more services could be provided. We wouldn't need to build new power plants if we use the existing energy more effectively. This is true for all regions. Reduction of energy consumption to 40% and electricity for all by the year 2030. The Vienna Energy Forum has set high goals. Even with a long implementation period, goals are kept in focus and a glance at California is taken. When I was elected, I made sure to keep my promise. We all work together, Democrats and Republicans, businesses and environmentalists, labor and everybody. And we, we forgot the divisions of the past so that we could create the policies for the future. They were fantastic for both the economy and also the environment. And right away, we showed the people action. We built the hydrogen highway, hydrogen fueling stations all over the state of California. We added a million solar roofs, the Green Building Initiative to make our office buildings more energy efficient, the renewable portfolio, 20% of renewables by the year 2010 and 33% by the year 2020. Now you have to add 15% to that because we don't count uh, hydro. And then of course the low carbon fuel standard, then the tailpipe emission, emission reductions, and of course AB32, our historic climate change law, where we made a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gases by 25% by the year 2020 and an additional 85% by the year 2050. In my own country, Ghana, we've set ourselves, we set ourselves a target as far back as 1989, you know, to achieve universal access to electricity by 2030. Sorry, by 2020. So we are in that 10-year frame and we are making progress as we speak now if you define access in terms of communities that have electricity in the community and the populations within those communities, then are, we are at already 70% plus and gunning forward you know, and aiming for that universal access. So countries like Ghana, we will achieve it. But the, the vast majority of countries in Africa have a long way to go. I mean, a good half or more, a good two thirds of African countries have energy access rates less than 50% something of that sort of order. So it's going to take some time. I mean, the 2030 target date is a more realistic time frame for the majority of African countries. But a few of us will make universal access by, by, by 2020 in the next 10 years. And hopefully the rest will follow in, in, in another 10 years. The green energy revolution. And so the question about freedom, my brother. Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger raised it, but I've heard it many times. I've heard it from even President Zapatero the first time here in Vienna two years ago. He said decentralized energy systems empowers people. It empowers people in the sense that they have access to information. It gives them dignity and freedom that they don't wait, wait for the greed to come. I know that for my village, that the day we have 24-hour electricity in my village, we have access to global information, internet, DSTV satellite, and we know in Africa, with the South African revolution on DSTV, even in our villages, we can see Manchester United in a number of villages today. But we already saw it in India years ago, how the Indians used television to send information on agricultural extension, to send information on healthcare. We know today that with the dig digital phone in Kenya, Motorola and others are already giving farmers telephone so they can check the price in Nairobi. That's what we mean about freedom. It's not about political freedom. It's just human freedom. The freedom to be creative, to have knowledge, information, without waiting for anybody. You just click. That's the freedom that energy revolution brings.